It is with pleasure that I come into your home today. Welcome to You Never Knew. My life has certainly been anything but good. We're joined today by veteran detective and legendary author John Cameron, author of It Was Always Me, Edward Edwards, the most prolific serial killer of all time. There are a few things I'd like to talk to you about. Build a fire in a person and not under him. Hey, thanks for joining us again. Um, I'm here with John Cameron, veteran detective and author. Uh, we've just finished watching It Was Him, The Many Murders of Edward Edwards on the Paramount Network, uh, of which covers John and his uh, amazing revelations of finding the Zodiac Killer. Okay, so John, y y I was very excited with the first episode, and then the second episode, you know, kind of got me going. But I, I, I gotta say, I'm hooked now. Uh, John Benet Ramsey? Yeah, actually, you know, the, the ransom note in the John Benet Ramsey case is signed Victory SBTC, and nobody could understand what that meant. Well, the Zodiac signed all of his letters with a cross and circle. And what that ransom note was signed by was signed by the cross. That's BTC. Signed by the cross. And victory is a Christian phrase. Satan won, basically, is what he's saying in that thing. You have the victory Christians, and you have victory Ed Edwards, who portrayed himself as Satan. That's really what he portrayed himself as. So in earlier, I mean, as the Zodiac, most of the people that he was killing that, that we knew about were, were, were older, at least adolescent uh, teens or, or so forth. But this stretches into, you know, some, some pretty young children. Yeah, he killed children his whole life. Many, many, many children, especially in Atlanta in 1979 and 80, where 24 little black kids were killed by what everybody thought could have been a cop. Well. Help me understand the environment. I've been told that there was a, a shift going on and that there was the, the first black captain or something. What? Yeah, the Atlanta Police Department was pretty divided between white and black, and the uh, management was going out. The white management was going out. The black management was coming in. And so there was a lot of tension going on, 79 and 80 in Atlanta. And so what better way to create more tension than by killing a bunch of little black kids and the suspect being a white police officer. And that's exactly what he did. So essentially, in, in, in all of Ed's killings, one of the commonalities is that he he's trying to punish somebody, whether it's the lover's lane people or whether it's the, the cheating husband or, or somebody else. In this case, he's trying to punish the police force? Yeah, in this case, he's trying to punish not only the police force, but the FBI had the largest task force going on down there at that time trying to catch the Atlanta child killer. What they didn't un understand is that the killer was amongst them. He was a white police officer in a Marietta, Georgia police uniform, and Ed had one. They found it in his house when he burned it down. And he got arrested in Atlanta right after the killings. So hold on, he got arrested in Atlanta while these killings were happening? No, the killing stopped, and they arrested Wayne Williams for the, uh, a couple other killings and then named him the Atlanta child killer. It was right after Wayne's uh, trial in March of 1982, Ed Edwards gets arrested in Atlanta. He burned down his house. I got a picture of him with his arm around the captain of the Atlanta Police Department. And his uh, relative was a sergeant with the Marietta, Georgia Police Department. So he had stolen the uniform from him, sucked up to the relative, was hiding out in Atlanta, killing kids as a white cop. Killing kids as a white cop and essentially framing the cops and Wayne Williams. Wayne's still in prison. He's been in prison 35 years now. And uh, I've spoke to him, uh, written letters with him. I sent him my book. Um, yeah, that, that's probably the longest serving person I know of right now. Is, he on, is, is he on death row or is he just gonna live a life? Life, life in prison and they will not let him out. They don't even wanna hear it. That, that, that's frustrating. I mean, there's an awful lot of families there that, as we've talked about before, have, have, have found some closure and it's difficult to, to bring it back up again. But I think that if I had known that the wrong guy, had thought that the wrong person had done something, I'd, I'd want to know what was, what was correct. And one thing most people don't understand is the Zodiac actually wrote a letter um, to the press in 1980 taking responsibility for the Atlanta child killings 
and teasing them that he used to kill women in San Francisco and now he's killing children. Yeah, that, that kind of blew me away. You put somebody away in prison, but then you take credit for it that almost you know, negates the purpose of framing somebody. Well, yeah, it, it, that, that creates terror, thinking they got the wrong guy. He just wants to see how the law enforcement's gonna react once they're told that you got the wrong guy. And they, they seem to react the same way every time. It's like, oh God, we don't want anybody to know about this, so let's just not talk about it. Now, the cops in Atlanta, they, you know, they seem to admit that there's a, a lack of communication you know, throughout the 80s. And from a technological standpoint, I mean, I, you know, that, that's probably pretty accurate. There has always been uh, miscommunication between police agencies, especially between city police departments, county sheriff's office. It was the same way in Montana. It's the same way everywhere I've been and everybody I know. Cops have this certain mentality that it's my murder case. You're not going to get in the middle of this. And that's what causes these types of wrongful convictions and no information sharing. OK, so you go from Atlanta to Colorado for John Bonet Ramsey. And your theory of the flashlight, which we talked about you know, earlier, you know, that plays a pretty big, big role in Ed's life again. Yeah, I really believe that he had already groomed his way into uh, Joan Bonet's life, so she was comfortable with him. He was basically a Santa Claus. It was Christmas time. There were many Santa Clauses around. And she let him in. You know, there was no forced entry into Joan Bonet's house. She was flashlighted to let him in once mom and dad were asleep. She was gonna get her special visit from the, Santa the, Claus. The, the flashlight, there was, which was found at the scene, uh, uh, as in several other murders, so you think that they did the little flashlight thing and she let Santa Claus in. Yeah, the mag light was left right on the counter. A, next, a mag light again. Next to the bowl of pineapple that she had eaten before she was killed. Well, who feeds Santa? Kids feed Santa. Kids this feed time, Santa. Santa fed the kid her favorite fruit. And I'm sure while she was eating it is when he garroted her and strangled her. Well, the Ramseys have certainly been through hell. I mean, we, losing their daughter would be bad enough, being accused of it and plastered all over international media it is unthinkable. Uh, do you think there's any closure there now? You know, Patsy died in 2005 um, from all the stress, cancer and everything else. Um, John's still searching for the truth. I've spoke to uh, Patsy's sister about it. I've given him the information. I think they're getting closure finally. And uh, I think this is the year they're gonna finally get their closure. Well, I, I, certainly, I certainly hope that this helps ease the public perception of the Ramseys. I know there was an awful lot of headlines and so forth that people were pretty mean to him because it, it looked to anybody reading the newspapers or watching television like, like they did it. It happened inside their house, there wasn't anybody else, and they were the number one suspects. And I, I can only imagine the terror. Yeah, you know, when you look back at all of Ed's cases, that's exactly what he did to everybody. He pitted people against people, and we devoured people unwittingly. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's just what happens when the press has a murder like that. They go crazy, and the people go crazy and are willing to destroy anybody. And tell me about the busing in the different letters. Well, in the Zodiac case, he threatened to blow up buses with children on them, and he spelt it wrong. He spelt it B-U-S-S-Y. And in the Joe Manet Ramsey note, he made the same type of an error, spelling but busy, busy, B-U-S-S-Y. And so that was a sign that it could be the Zodiac that had killed Joe Manet also. Or, or at least somebody trying to, trying to portray that it would be. So then you go back to Ohio for the Danny Boy murders. Now that, that we know for sure. Yeah, he pled guilty to that murder, and that murder was in 1996, the same year as Joe Manet Ramsey. But, but he, he planned that murder for two years. That, that didn't appear to be one that fit the, the pattern of him punishing bad people, in, in less, unless Danny Boy was a bad person, but uh, that seemed to be more motivated by money. That's exactly right. He was going to collect $250,000. He did, didn't he? he? And he got it in 97, the year after Joe Manet. And the intention there was just to collect the money and take in this boy and make him think that he's in a loving family finally, but the whole time plotting 
to kill him after two years he plotted and then hiding his body and then planting his body and then teasing the cops yeah. for the in, rest of his life. In Ed's confession, he, he's pretty clear that that's the only interest he, he ever had in Danny Boy. He wasn't trying to be a good Samaritan or anything else. He simply looked at him as a, as a vulnerable child without any family that would be an easy mark. Right, and when I interviewed April um, back in 2010, she said he had more men lined up like that that he had groomed his way into. He was an insurance fraud artist, and he writes about that in his book as far back as 1950s, staging accidents, having lawyers on his side to collect money. I mean, it was an easy way to make a living by killing and collecting. Killing and collecting, and burning down houses. Yeah, he did that repeatedly. Unbelievable, unbelievable. On the tombstone of Danny Boy, it says Danny Boy Edwards. Um, that's just sickening, but he had actually changed his name legally to, to Danny Boy Edwards, right? Yeah, his real name was Danny Law Glockner. And the whole purpose to change his name was because the only way Ed could collect life insurance is if he was his kid now. Mm -hmm. And so Ed forced him. To... How, how old was Danny Boy when he killed him? He was 23, 24 years old when he was killed. He was around uh, 21 when he met him. Um, he was just a very low IQ individual that really had no family. So he was a perfect target. There was nobody to, you know, to figure out what Ed was doing. So he was old enough, he was a, you know, a full-blown adult, so Ed wasn't his guardian or, or anything along those lines. He just basically manipulated him and gave him some, some love or whatever else that, that Danny Boy was missing. Yeah, that's exactly what he did. The, the guy was an adult, he wasn't a child at all. But like Ed says in his interviews, Danny did what I told him to, and that's what everybody did with Ed. Yeah, well, say what you want about Ed, but I mean, he was very meticulous with, with what he did in Danny Boy's death and, and others as well. Yeah, everything was planned out, and he makes that statement in his book that he did everything deliberately, cold-bloodedly, and he planned it out. And that was every murder. Nothing was off the cuff. So it wasn't like someone just rubbed him wrong and the next thing you know, he went over to their house and killed him. Well, he may have gone over later on and he would have planned it. He would never kill anybody immediately without thinking twice, am I gonna get caught on this one? Mm -hmm. Or can I get them next year? Okay, well, thank you again. And the country is in debt to you for the time that you sacrificed and the research that you've uncovered. And, and this truly amazing book. Uh, again, if you, if you guys haven't read the book, it's called It Was Always Me, Ed Edwards, the most prolific serial killer of all time. And it is, uh, it's an evolution of the first book that, that started all of this and effectively you know, caught the Zodiac, which is It's Me, no, Edward Wayne Edwards, the serial killer you've never heard of, which um, if you can get a copy of that book, I suggest you, you know, wrap it in plastic and put it away because it, I, it will not be produced again. But thank you again, and I hope to see you soon. All right. Thanks for having me on, Barry. <laughs>